and when folks have to. Hello, everybody. Um, we're going to let some folks, uh, we're going to wait just a few seconds, kind of let folks start piling on in. Um, and then I'll make some quick announcements and we will get started. Hope everyone is having a good day today. Overcast, but not too bad. All right, let's see. Okay. So it looks we got a fair amount of folks hopping in. I'm going to wait just a little bit longer. <clears throat> All right. So I think I'll go ahead and get started here as more and more folks start to file on in. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us for another installment of Grow With Us, brought to you by the Dallas Public Library Seed Library and the Dallas Environmental Quality and Sustainability. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, I am Davis. I'm with the Dallas Public Library Seed Library. Just a few quick announcements, kind of some housekeeping. Um, some things we want to talk about as far as the presentation today. Um, we are recording this and it is being um, live streamed on YouTube. Um, and so if uh, any of you don't want your likeness to end up on this video, um, as it might possibly uh, happen, please go, go ahead and turn off your video. Um, that, that way, because you can also this will be recorded as well, and it will be saved and stored on the um, the uh, Grow With Us, the Dallas Public Library's Grow With Us page. So you can search this uh, at a later time if you want to come back, um, kind of reference it or anything like that. But yeah, so if you don't want your likeness ending up on this video, please do go ahead and make sure to turn your um, camera off. Second, um, this will be just kind of the basic presentation. Um, format where um, we're going to be muting everyone. Um, and if you've got any questions, any comments, anything that you'd like to contribute, um, you can go ahead and type that on into the chat. We'll be keeping an eye on the chat. And um, yeah, that's really about it. Um, I think now I'm going to hand it on over to Helen with uh, Dallas Environmental Quality and Sustainability. Helen. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Helen Dulac. I'm with the City of Dallas Environmental Quality and Sustainability, and we are super excited to be partnering with the Dallas Seed Library, which is part of the Dallas Public Library, on this series called Grow With Us. It is on Mondays at noon. I'm going to give you a quick little introduction about my department because you might have never heard of us before. So uh, Dallas Environmental Quality actually was formed back in 2004, but then we had a different name. We were called the Office of Environmental Quality, or OEQ. We worked really hard for four years to help Dallas become the very first city in the United States to achieve a special international environmental certification called ISO 14001. So what we did is we looked at all of our operations to see how we could provide the same level of service with lessening our impact on the environment. And we are audited every year to keep the certification. But what's even more remarkable about, the, remarkable about this is that we're talking about Dallas, Texas. We're not talking about a city in California. We're not talking about a city in Colorado. We're not talking about Austin. We're talking about Dallas did this first. So we do have a history of being green and with your help, we can be even greener. Let's fast forward 10 years where a lot of changes happened to this department. There was a restructuring in the city and some other environmental programs and operations were moved into OEQ. So to reflect that change, we changed our name and that's when we became environmental quality and sustainability. We also doubled in size. Now, some of those operations that moved over were some more outreach and education people. So we created a expanded and combined outreach and engagement team that I'm a proud member of. The following year in 2019, Mayor Johnson set up a special committee of Dallas City Council uh, focused on the environment and sustainability. You can watch those meetings live the first Monday of every month. And it's a great way to keep a pulse on the city about all the different green projects and pilots that are going on. 
And if you have heard about my department, it's probably because on May 27th of 2020, the city passed the Comprehensive Environmental and Climate Action Plan known as CCAP. And that is uh, historic because we're one of the few inland cities, a city that's not along the coast that has a climate plan. It is our roadmap for the next 30 years on how we're going to mitigate climate change and improve the quality of life for everybody in Dallas. You can see all 250 pages of the plan at dallasclimateaction.com. And you can also see uh, how all of the things that we're gonna be doing feed into that plan, including presentations like today. So I mentioned that this department doubled in size a couple years ago. What you see in green are the groups that joined us. And I wanna talk about one of those just briefly, and that is storm water management. And that's gonna become really important because we're predicted to have some storms uh, later this afternoon, maybe even during this presentation. So storm water is anytime rain or even water that comes from a hose does not absorb into the ground. So this water flows over your yard, goes into your driveway, goes down the sidewalk and then ends up in the street and it's gonna flow all the way down that gutter to that big drain at the end of the street. Well, that big drain is called a storm drain inlet and it's there for one reason and that's to keep the streets from flooding. So the, the water from the hoses or the rain or even snow melt can go down those gutters, those storm drain inlets and it's, and it's taken directly into a creek or stream and then it goes into one of our beautiful lakes or the Trinity River. Nowhere in that cycle is this water cleaned or treated. So if it picks up any pollution along the way, whether it's litter, bacteria that might be in pet waste, uh, chemicals that were put on your lawns or in your flower beds or something like that, or even vehicle fluids that have leaked out of cars, that's how a lot of that pollution ends up in our lakes and the Trinity River. And the Trinity River doesn't stay in Dallas. It flows an extra 500 miles all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. So there's a good chance that pollution from our cities, from our neighborhood, from our homes, ends up with the dolphins in the Gulf of Mexico. So please just be mindful about what you do outside. Make sure that you follow directions if you're applying anything, you fix with leaky vehicles, you uh, pick up uh, like leaves and, and uh, grass clippings, don't blow those in the street because all of those things can become pollution. So I mentioned the uh, outreach and engagement team that I'm a member of. We want to empower Dallas to save the earth. And we do that by virtual presentations like this and in person as uh, things start opening up. Uh, currently, if you are in Dallas and you would like for us to give you a presentation for an HOA meeting or local, local club or organization, we can do that at no cost. We also have a lot of materials for students from K to college and we can participate in virtual seminars, activities and events. And as things open up, we're gonna start seeing you in person. If you invite us to, to join you, what do we talk about? Well, we talk about environmental topics from A to Z, all the way from air quality to zero waste. Now we also host some of our own events. A lot of those are gonna be virtual. Uh, coming up is gonna be the Climate Change Symposium. That's gonna be, I believe, in March or early April. We also have Earth Day coming up. We have some exciting things planned for that. And also starting on April 1st is the Wyland Mayor's Water Conservation Challenge. And last year, Dallas won. We beat cities like Phoenix and LA and New York by having people take a pledge, say that they're uh, doing it on behalf of the city of Dallas and promising to do different types of things to save water and improve water quality. So start uh, looking out for that and make sure that you take the pledge so Dallas can be number two, I mean, number one, two years in a row. So with that, uh, we have a website called greendallas.net that you could always uh, visit. Uh, to get more information. And that's also where, if you want to invite us to participate in your event, you're gonna fill out the event request form on the homepage. Of course, follow us on social media. We are Green Dallas TX on Facebook and at Green Dallas on Twitter and Instagram. That's where you can learn about all the upcoming programs we have, uh, uh, learn more about the Wyland Mayor's Challenge, learn more about the Climate Change Symposium and all the other things we got. And also if you ever need to reach me or anybody on my team, all you have to do is drop an email to greendallas at dallascityhall.com. That's greendallas at dallascityhall.com and someone will get back to you. And with that, I am really excited to introduce our guest speaker today. Uh, we are featuring Linda Harvey. And in a moment, she's going to share her screen. And Linda Harvey has been a Denton County Master Gardener since 2005. She specializes in earth kind, vegetables, and entomology, which is the study of insects. But today she's gonna to be talking to us about organic gardening, 
Uh, and I think this is going to be a fantastic presentation. It's gonna answer a lot of the questions that we get. So remember, put those questions in the chat. And if Linda does not answer them in her presentation, we will ask them to her at the end. All right, Linda, take it away. Thank you very much. I'm very, very happy to be with you today and to talk about organic gardening as we welcome spring. A uh, bit of a disclaimer I'm putting up here that I did this research on my own and it is for educational purposes. That's what master gardeners do. They educate on horticulture, the study of plants and everything around them. Uh, I may show some vendors or products. It doesn't condone or condemn those particular subjects. They're used as examples and to make things more understandable. So I hope you enjoy this educational presentation and even find it a bit uh, entertaining at times. For our agenda, we're going to look at the term organic gardening. What does it mean and what does it mean to you? Then we'll look at the practice of organic gardening and the pests that may occur and what to do about them organically. That term organic gardening, it probably means something different to everyone on this presentation. Let's take a look. Uh, the description, the definition, details can be quite dramatically different and even contrary to one another. For some, organic gardening is a philosophy. It, it, it's a state of mind. It's also, to many, a methodology, things that you do in a certain order or procedurally. For many, it is a holistic approach. It's actually part of your life as well as the life of the earth and people and pets and everything around in nature. The term organic gardening is credited to Lord Northburn of Walter James in 1940. And he was commenting at that time about the, the substitution of chemical farming instead of organic far farming. And he was very worried about the artificial manure industry producing specifically nitrogen and then seeing it induced into, into the soil systems and, and around the land in general. He was concerned about the biological self-sufficiency of nature not allowed to being taken, take care of itself as it did normally. So I, I got to thinking about chemical farming and well, if Lord Northburn is commenting on this in 1940, when did the chemicals start? I often hear chemical uh, farming, uh, gardening referred to as the conventional. Well, I think of it as the non-conventional. Well, the fertilizer industry started in the 1840s. Uh, it started with this Sir John Bennett Laws, and he was actually first discovered the uh, isolating phosphate for the use with plants, and then found that nitrogen really increased the wheat yields. And they were able to separate nitrogen off and then produce that as a fertilizing chemical. A bit later, in 1909, we had Fritz Haber, who was uh, the first really to do a mass production of hydrogen. And he was joined by Carl Bosch and funded through BASF to commercially scale the production of nitrogen, uh, production of ammonia. And think about the timing on this. Nitrogen then began to be used in munitions in World War I. You can see on the right that you have the natural method of getting nitrogen, as well as they figured out uh, industrial production of nitrogen. I did some more research to see, uh, well, instead of just saying anti-synthetics uh, or chemical treatments, where is the study of organics itself? We can attribute that to Sir Albert Howard. He studied the verdict Indians in India for 26 years and then produced a book about this in 1931. And it's called The Waste Products of Agriculture. It was actually what we would refer to as the recycling. And it dealt with more than just the products. It was the whole methodology and the importance of the living soil itself, having water uh, available to the plants 
uh, having humus in there, the role of the mycorrhizal fungi, even things you couldn't even see were happening in the life of the soil itself. Now, he studied this along with his wife, Gabrielle Howard of 1905, it fits right in there, 26 years, they're together studying the effects of uh, natural gardening in India. Uh, unfortunately, his wife, Gabrielle, a botanist, she passed away in 1930, just as their book was being published. However, he then married her sister, Louise Howard, and they continue to publish and uh, spread the word about organic gardening. As a matter of fact, after he passed away, she continued the campaign worldwide. She was an activist in both labor and agriculture. So uh, there are women behind this too. And uh, the team of Sir Albert Howard and his two wives can be greatly credited with organic gardening. And they did their publications aimed at the uh, general population, not just agriculture and farming, but also the whole theories behind uh, gardening. And that brings us to the US, to the United States. There was a man, J.I. Rodell, and uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Rodell publications on organic gardening. Well, it started in the 1940s there, and uh, J.I. Rodell was a disciple, a follower of Albert Howard and had his book. And at this time in the 1940s, there is a shortage of this chemical, this nitrogen, because of uh, post-World War I and World War II. And he wanted to get back to the wholesome way, the natural way of doing things. And he created the idea of communicating the nutrient-rich, contaminant-free soils. He published a book in 1948 and uh, gives credit to Albert Howard in that book. And I understand that Albert Howard wrote the foreword to it before his death. You can get this book uh, on Amazon. They are still producing it. It is that important. And uh, not only is it the importance of organic gardening for your produce, it also uh, talks about the link between chemical agriculture and declining public health. So I invite you to do your own further research and I think it's fascinating. Well, what is the USDA part of the uh, certified organic? Well, the United States government Department of Agriculture does have a USDA organic seal. It is highly regulated. It is specific to agriculture. It will list the chemicals or non-chemicals uh, certified as organic to use in the entire process of producing uh, vegetables and edibles, and including uh, fruits and trees. And the, the list is extensive in both directions as far as what is uh, organic and acceptable, as well as may be non-organic, but can be used in part of the process. It is, as I said, regulated. You have to go through specific certification processes in order to have this seal. Oh, got a little pause there on my PowerPoint. Let's see if it comes back up for me. It's thinking, whoop, I, I apologize. I hit the link there instead of went forward. All right. So as far as organic gardening, well, it's not the same as organic farming and agriculture. It's not regulated. It, in general, it's uh, emulating nature. We recognize the symbiotic relationships in the environment, the circle of life. It's, it's paying attention to the long-term life and health of the soil, any of the plant life produced as well as any of the creatures, any of the wildlife, any of the insects, all part of that circle of life. And of course, humans for the long term. It's the life of the earth and it, it, sustaining us all. And uh, the USDA does comment on organic gardening, uh, emphasizing the, the absence of synthetic fertilizers and pesticides. 
They also talk there about IPM that we see as procedural uh, items that methods that were used with organic gardening over time. It's biological, cultural, and physical controls before you reach for any type of chemical toxin. It could be an organic one, but let's do some methodology before we reach for some, some spray or some additive. So what organic gardening is not? It's not quackery. There's plenty of people that think uh, organics is full of bull, you know, why bother with it? It is not home remedies and repurposing shampoo and household goods. It certainly is not political. Uh, that it has reached governments is a good sign that it's very good that we're uh, increasing awareness and, and getting back to the basics. It's not a passing trend, if anything, it is a growing trend and it's not for vegetables only. And by the way, um, I've been using pictures from my garden for a couple of reasons. I got feedback on other presentations I've done and people like seeing it in use right here in Texas. I live in Flower Mound, a bit Northwest of, of the city of Dallas itself. So this really does work. It works in our conditions that can be in the very, very high temperatures as well as very, very dry. It does work. So I encourage you to use these and make your own garden a pleasant place. So let's talk about the soil and what happens with the soil. It's, it's from the ground up. I love this chart. And this was, I had my noetic moment when I saw this. I always thought that sand was the smallest particles. What's wrong with me? Look at sand, you can see the particles. Well, they are large or regular particles that don't pack together uh, very easily. And they have a lot of pore space because they're, they're separated there and they're irregularly shaped. And we all know that water flows right through it. Uh, if you've been to the beach, you know water goes right through it and doesn't stay around for the roots of plants very well. Meanwhile, there's also silt, smaller particles than sand, smaller pore spaces, but it does hold water a little bit better. And then there's clay, which ended up being the very smallest particles. It has a very large surface area, can hold more water, but it has this way of uh, drying out into a brick-like substance when it is dry, and being gushy and gooey when wet that you really think you could make some pottery. So as far as plants are concerned, in order to get water and to get air, they really like a mix of all three of these and that's called loam. So how do you know what's in your soil? You don't need to send your, your uh, dirt, your soil off for testing. You can use a jar, and put about one third of this dirt in there and about one half of water, put a lid on. This doesn't have to be a fancy jar, a salsa jar, a spaghetti sauce jar will do nice and clean. Shake it up and let it sit probably overnight, 24 hours. And then it will naturally settle into the sand, silt and clay areas. Loam is a, a mixture of relatively, uh, it would be ideal to be within those ranges, about a third clay, uh, a third to 50% silt, and 25 to 50% sand would be ideal. You might not get ideal, and uh, particularly more in the Dallas County area, you may have more clay uh, than I have. As I said, I live Northwest. I'm actually in one of those sand bands in my backyard, and I have clay in my front yard. We're on a couple acres here. So I'm right on the border of uh, one of those sand areas. So what can you do if you don't have the perfect mix? Add some compost. Compost is definitely natural. It's an organic materials mixed together, such as leaves, grass clippings, animal manure. And it what mixed together does a chemical and biological reaction of its own for the, the ultimate food and it's nourishing the soil. It helps it hold moisture, makes those air pockets. You can buy it or you can make your own. And if um, 
you see my pile there in the yard. Our neighbors had some trees trimmed and had them shredded on the spot. It was during July last year, had leaves, uh, leaves out there as well as the bark and I let it sit and I'm still using my, uh, this. there were two piles of this magnitude. So I'm still using right now and spreading it. So it can also be very free. Why use the compost? Well, it's like nature's floor in, in the forest. It's going to help the soil and plants as well as insects, birds, and animals. They're living in it. They're producing that circle of life, insects for rodents and birds to eat. And it's bringing other nutrients in to, to the soil. You're not going to get your microorganisms, your mycorrhizal fungi from a bag of nitrogen fertilizer. It's not going to happen. That, that is not alive. And you're not going to get the worm action and the insect larvae. I mean, they're in there creating the air pockets and they're pooping to give you even more nutritional content. This is bringing your balance. If I have to say anything about compost, it's balance. And we're gonna look at that a bit more. It's also bringing a balance to the pH. And that, and you might've heard this term, makes the minimal content available. So what does that have to do with, well, here's a chart. So this is how uh, the alkaline or the acidity level affects the ability of plants to absorb it, to take it up and use that mineral content. You can see the ultimate, ultimate pH range is from 6.2 to 7.3. At that level, it's getting an optimal blend for many plants of the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, that core three, but they're also getting sulfur, calcium, magnesium, and then the other micronutrients at basically optimal amounts. Different plants will have, will prefer more alkaline or more acetic, but essentially this is their way of being able to absorb and take them up into their system and get the nutrition that they need to reproduce their own seeds. And for us, as far as edibles, uh, their, their own um, herbaceousness, their leaves, as well as their, their fruits, their fruits and veg. Uh, and root stock. If you want to make your own compost, it's not rocket science. There's my son. Uh, he's about 10 years old there. And he did this as a science experiment. He mixed the carbon to nitrogen and basically levels are three to one or two to one as far as carbon, which is browns like leaves and uh, brown matter like uh, dead grasses and a straw to nitrogen and nitrogen are greens and things that are stinky when wet. And we'll have a chart on this. And for an optimal compost pile, it should be three foot by three by three cubically. And you want it to be moist like a damp sponge. It does use air and time to process. And voila, you will have compost. Now what you don't need, which are optional, is to have a bin. You could just simply make a pile. The bin makes it convenient and makes it contain, and it keeps everything together. So it's having the biological, physical, and the chemical reactions going on in the pile. You don't need a thermometer. His test was, uh, his hypothesis was that the compost pile would uh, produce into compost uh, proportional to the air temperature. Absolutely not correct. And he did this in February. They made their own heat and he was measuring and uh, he, he had marvelous charts to prove that it makes its own heat. You do not need an inoculant. He did not use one, it heated up on its own. Many think that they need to put this compost pile in the sun to get heat. No, oh, absolutely the, almost the opposite because you don't want it to dry out rapidly. So you don't need to have sun or heat. Uh, do you need a pitchfork? It doesn't need turned. If you do turn it, it remixes the area, introduces more air into the, the core as well as spreads the moisture. And that's pretty much the difference between an active and a passive compost pile. It will still turn into compost. It may take a little longer 
uh, if you don't turn it, but if you want it to produce quicker, go ahead and mix it up. It's like when you're mixing your oatmeal, it just makes itself creamy faster. I think of it that way. This is the ins and the outs for compost. I rather like this uh, showing the greens there. Again, stinky when wet. Uh, Manures, of course, stinky when wet, but there's other things like uh, hair and feathers, which are nitrogen sources. The browns are high in carbon, uh, leaves, bark, straw chips. Uh, I'd be very careful with the newspaper. When we moved into our current house, there was newspaper in a compost bin and uh, was wet and it turned into paper mache. So make sure that it is well mixed in smaller particles. And uh, they do not use, I'd agree on those, many of them take um, uh, longer uh, to break down, or uh, if you don't get hot enough in the case of weed seeds or diseased plants, it may not kill them completely out. So I encourage you to do it. I usually have an active pile all the time, and it's just, it's just fun to watch nature at work. Here's other forms of composting. You're not going to build a pile, that's fine. You can cold compost, meaning it's not gonna reach that high heat. Just keep adding as you go, like your kitchen scraps, taking them out. Or you can dig a trench and put them in the trench and let them uh, uh, go into composted materials underground. You can plant specifically for the idea that it's a cover crop, you're going to turn it in the green into the soil. I do that with barley. You can pick your cover crops to either remove things that are in the soil that you don't want. In the case of marigolds, they remove the nasty nematodes or add nutrients like in the case of legumes help to build the nitrogen level. And also you can do the green manures in the cooler seasons that help you to reduce erosion. There is worm composting, the ultimate pets. I uh, have worms, I keep worms in a bin in my pantry and uh, they're the perfect pets. You can give them your kitchen scraps and uh, you want them to poop. And it, it's oddly, it's not smelly and it's, uh, it's quite nice to have it handy. And I do empty mine out periodically and it's a good source of uh, excellent compost. Now, what you're looking at is another composting form and it's called a keyhole garden. This is in my backyard. And a keyhole garden came out of a concept in Africa. It's about eight feet across and you can see the keyhole on there. It's a little area where you can walk up and feed your compost bin, which is in the center of this. It continuously feeds, keeps moisture and nutrients going to your plants in the round. Now, <clears throat> This is the keyhole garden as it was planted in very early April on the left. And on the right, you can see it, it works very well and it's producing all kinds of vegetables. I have planted this in different methods or different crops, rotating out what I put in there. You can make it themed since it's round and make it look like a pizza with marigolds on the outside edge for uh, the crust and plant tomatoes and oregano and peppers in there. I've also done it as a salsa garden and uh, I do change it out periodically and I have done it as an herb garden, though herbs don't need as much um, in the, uh, uh, the, the nitrogen area and they tend to like it a little drier than, than, other, uh, than other vegetable types of crops. How do you do this keyhole garden? Well, there's a side view from the San Diego Union Tribune. They're doing this all over the world and all over the United States. My favorite article to follow comes from the Texas Co-op. Uh, we're co-serve here in Denton County, and I have the reference down there. They are doing this all over Texas, building these. As far as the outer edges, you can use any kind of materials. You could use regular rocks. You saw I use the uh, preformed cinder kind of blocks. Build it, feed it, grow it, and continue to feed it year round. I feed mine about three times a year because that compost pile, and again, I'm not turning it. Um, it does cook down by itself, and it's just a wonderful, wonderful way to, uh, to maintain compost level, nutrient moisture level to your plants during the growing season. 
wait a minute, I've done everything. My plants are growing so well. I need an alternate fertilizer. I don't want to use a synthetic. What else can I use to get some of that nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium? There are natural organic fertilizers, and you see them there. Uh, blood meal, fish meal, et cetera. You can get this also from horse uh, animal manures. And I put them in my preferred, uh, preferred sequence. Uh, depends on where that horse has been eating, whether you're going to get a lot of seed or not. I, uh, when I lived in Pennsylvania, we had uh, Morgan show, show horses as neighbors and they, they were only grain fed. It was wonderful. I didn't have seed, uh, weed seed issues. Rabbit is super good. And I do use rabbit there in the keyhole garden. There's also chicken, which tends to be a little strong and a little stinky. Uh, cow does come with plenty of weed seed. I would definitely pre-compost that and many others. There's your green manures and, and uh, nitrogen comes from the legumes, the peas and beans, also the rock minerals. So you can add these. Now, advantages of the organic fertilizers, they also not only bring the nutrient of the NPKs, they're bringing the biological factors with them, the microbial activity. They are slow release and they stay, they get uh, incorporated into the soil more readily. They stay longer and they're not going to, if applied correctly, throw those bright green sprouts off of your, your vegetables and your trees and your, your shrubbery and flowers that attract the harmful insects. So they're slow release, they're good for the soil in the long term, and when it's raining, they're not washing away and, and, and being harmful to the environment in that way. They don't dissipate into the air the way a chemical pe uh, uh, pe palletized uh, synthetic would do also. You can also do foliar feeding when your plants are up. And I know this is controversial. I've done it and I've had success. You're going to spray the leaves with a weak, emphasis on weak, you don't want to overwhelm these plants, a weak solution of compost tea or fish emulsion. Uh, potassium content is highly recommended. You're going to be spraying when it's cool, morning or very late afternoon. These stomata, the pores in the, in the leaf bottoms are open and they're ready to absorb this at that time. Don't do it when it's too hot. And of course, you're going to want a low windy day so it sticks where you're putting it. And I've had great success with this on my vegetables. And you see patty pan squash there. Uh, growing and it, it's delightful. I also think that it kind of, um, and I didn't prove this scientifically, I think it uh, makes the bad bugs stay away because I, I'm putting something on there that the leaves are going yum. And uh, generally speaking, insects are attracted to unhealthy plants. So I think it's good for that reason too. What about mulch? This is a top layer of organic material like shredded woods or leaves. And I have plenty of mulch right now. Uh, it's going to keep that moisture in, prevent weeds from sprouting. It moderates the temperature, keeping it warm when it's cool out as well as cool when it gets too hot. It's keeping your microbes safe and healthy underground there. It is environmentally green. It's stopping erosion. I happen to think it's pretty and uh, it's, it's good all the way around. It's a slow, slow form of fertilizing too because the compost is breaking, it's breaking down into compost. So what's the difference between mulch and compost? Basically time, uh, though mulch tends to be dominant in the carbon area, it is still gonna break down over time, which is good too. So go ahead and compost away. Uh, and if, you're, if your particles are too big, use it as mulch. Or if you get lucky like me and have a, a very large source. Next, we'll look at plant selection. So for all plants, think about what are the conditions that you have that they want to grow in. You have sun or shade. What's their water need and nutritional needs going to be? And what's the max or minimum temperature they're going to like to live at? 
whether they're perennial or annual, they want certain temps. Uh, are they going to be disease resistant or actually attract some pest? You don't want to, to put in, uh, say, a shrubbery like uh, uh, Unonymous that has a Unonymous bug is named after it. So you might want to avoid things like that. And then Penny's there, that's my dog, uh, to remind uh, everyone to think about plants that are dangerous. Uh, for example, a very beautiful decorative plant is a castor bean, highly poisonous to pets as well as, as people. If you do go to the water lily gardens in San Angelo, oddly, there are castor beans all the way around this beautiful garden area. But do consider it in your own garden. Oleanders are also poisonous. So consider things that are poisonous and keep them in a, a safe place in, in your garden. The thing I fail at most often, and you're going to see it, is mature size. So please pay attention to mature size. If you're going to be growing vegetables, are they desirable? Is it something you're going to eat or you can pawn off on your neighbors or even better, take it to a, a, a food collection area for those that are in need. Consider the time to harvest. Will you be around? How long does it take? What is the weather going to be like at harvest time? The classic, of course, is, this is tomatoes. Uh, tomatoes don't like to set fruit after 89 degrees. So it's going to get hot real quick, but you've got to get them in the ground. They don't like cold ground. It's got to be warm enough for them to get in. So it's always the battle of putting them in here in the spring. But also remember, we're going to have more than one season, more than co more coming up on that subject. Uh, where are you going to get these as seeds or are you going to buy them as potted or are you going to seed start inside? And then in your plant selection, do you want an heirloom, cultivar, a hybrid, or is it GMO? And, and what's the difference? Well, we'll look at that. Now we're gonna talk about all plant types. I will concentrate on vegetables for the sake of time, but regardless of when you're picking, consider all of those uh, different attributes in flowers, whether they're annual and perennial, there is maintenance with perennials. Get over it, you're gonna to have to take care of them too. They're not, they're not uh, task free. Are you going to pick native, non-natives or cultivars? And again, the form that you're going to get these in. When it comes to trees, all of the above, plus are they going to need trimming maintenance? Mature size again, mature size. And do you want them flowering or fruiting? And where are you going to put them? You don't want the flowers and fruits of trees uh, on your walkways uh, being a hazard or staining or certainly not going in your pool. So think about those when you're doing your selections. That does include crepe myrtles. Ah, how are you going to know all of this information? Well, it's on the plant tags or the seed packets. Now that I did choose botanical interest to show you the wealth of information on their seed packets. They go into great detail, including telling you if they are heirloom or if they are cultivars, if they're GM, non-GMO, and it gives you planting information in great detail. Probably one of the best. They do boast about, uh, and you can see there on the link, leader of the packet. So all the information specific to that variety that you are going to be selecting and planting. And they do also have this information online. If you just want to learn about plants, read the packets that this, this is very good information. Now, let's talk about that difference between the, uh, the, the different uh, heirloom, cultivar, et cetera. The simple selection was happening for, for a long, long, long periods of time over history where farmers and gardeners would save particular seeds, usually the largest and a very early ripening uh, of a particular fruit vegetable to save the seeds to carry on traits that they found good. It could have been the, uh, 
the flavor or the uh, size of the plant. And they would keep maintaining this over the years to result in a strain that they found a very welcoming and usable. And farmers that were in different regions may have started with the same seeds, but given the conditions in their particular garden and farm, they may have ended up with a different uh, heirloom, a different, uh, a different plant. Now we come down to cross-pollination and cross-pollination happens when it's two plants in the, in the same, same type of uh, species and they're cross-pollinated uh, with uh, intentionally little help from humans and they end up with a different cultivated variety, a cultivar. And it's pretty much with luck when you're doing this out in the open that the offspring plants exhibit a new trait, a new behavior that you like to maintain. Whereas hybrid is a cultivar, a cultivated variety, but it's done with specific traded plants in a controlled environment. And they are very stable in the two original plants that they start with. They cross pollinate them and what they yield is an F1 hybrid. Now the F1 hybrid uh, is studied to have the particular traits that are desirable, but the seeds of the hybrid do not necessarily produce the same type of traits. And uh, they're closely related again in the type of species that they are. A, a, an example of this is the early girl F1 hybrid as an example. And you can tell by the, uh, the name in itself, one of its traits is that it is an early producer. Now going on in the types of seeds and reproductive plants, we have natural mutations. Something may uh, just normally, it's a mistake. It could be a mistake in nature and DNA replication. An offspring or a part of a plant has a different trait that is desirable. They're often called sports uh, when it's a whole plant or it simply can be a branch uh, coming off of a plant. Many of these are reproduced or propagated through slips, grafting, and cuttings. And a lot of your variegated plants are done this way. There are also induced mutations. So things started to get a little too um, human controlled here for, for some people's um, desires that plant breeders induce a mutation through radiation or chemicals looking for a particular beneficial change. And this uh, does change the tissues of them. They, they maintain these in a sterile condition to form this. They are artificially induced, but it is still the same species of plants. Uh, ruby fruit, ruby grapefruit rather, and ice cube lettuce are two of these that have been commercially produced. Now we get to GMOs and what makes GMOs very different is you're no longer using a same species. It's two different organisms and not necessarily two different plants. Bt corn actually takes a bacteria, Bacillus thuringiensis, and it is bombarded genetically into corn seeds. And the idea here is Bt, Bacillus thuringiensis, is a bacteria that will kill worms, uh, caterpillars. So they're making that part of the plant that induces the Bt into the corn itself. Another type of GMO is to have Roundup induced into the plant matter itself. Roundup is a chemical um, glyphosate. And uh, what they're doing is to make the, uh, the vegetable production not affected through glyphosate, that the glyphosate would kill the weeds only when mass sprayed or applied, that the uh, desired plants would continue on and be glyphosate resistant. Uh, there are also other GMOs for different conditions for a plant. It could be its nutritional value 
It can also make it so it's less damaged in shipping or has a longer shelf life. Well, many, many, uh, many people, many countries, they are very worried about this around the world. Uh, the term frankenfoods is, uh, is used to say what, what are the long-term effects, what is happening to others in the food chain if they are uh, eating or, uh, or even cross-pollinated with these plants. And they feel that corn is no longer straight corn because of the nature of how it gets pollinated, that it does include these GMO uh, conditions that are now being in, introduced into, uh, into many crops that weren't intended. So do pay attention. I understand that uh, they're, they're required in labeling now to also tell you this on the potted plants that you're buying. All right, we're ready for techniques. So I can go over that a little too quickly, but we're ready for organic gardening techniques. And we're going to follow the French method here right now. And uh, they called theirs intensive gardening. That's, so some of the terminologies are um, used uh, alternately, uh, intensive gardening, sustainable gardening, organic gardening, natural gardening. Uh, with the French, they want to build and maintain the soil fertility naturally. They prefer beds, planting in beds rather than fields of rows. I did visit a garden in France and they were absolutely doing this. It's nothing new. You had monks doing this for since medieval times, planting in their beds instead of rows. Now, something that interested me, I'm doing it this coming season, Rather than just raised beds, they did sunken beds. I'm like, oh, why didn't I think of this? A sunken bed makes so much more sense for hot, dry summers. So this year, I'm going to have some sunken beds. Basically, the only thing I did with sunken beds ever before was potatoes, but this year, we're going to have more crops coming from sunken beds. Also in this French intensive gardening that you'll see in organic gardening is doing close spacing of plants. You're shielding the soil from weeds from germinating and you're cooling the ground. You saw this in the three sisters technique of the corn growing tall to support the beans growing up, the beans producing more nitrogen into the soil and then the, uh, the uh, I'm looking right at them. The squash down below, which is shading, shading the ground and keeping it moist and cool. Also interplanting, go ahead and plant vegetables with flowers and herbs. It confuses those bad bugs and brings in the pollinators. And it also brings in the critters, the part of the food chain that's going to help you, ground beetles, birds, and lizards. More French techniques are succession planning, relay, and crop rotate, rotation that we'll take a look at coming up. Now, if you're planting, consider your diversity and your complementary plants. You'll have to pick plants that do uh, suit the same needs as far as their feeding, their fertility of what they're going to like, their growth habit, so they are complementary like those three sisters. And because you're gonna read those seed packets, you can look at their pest quotient, uh, see if they're um, not going to uh, be uh, vulnerable to different, uh, say the mosaic kind of uh, infections. And uh, you'll also be able, and we're going to look at companion planting, pick plants that are gonna complement one another and actually act as trap plants or bring in the beneficial insects. You see on the right there that I have a mix of hibiscus, uh, green beans, and what's in the background? Oh, you can't see too much in the background, but I know that there's a tomato right to the right of these, those growing. We'll see more coming up. The feeder features, listing there, the heavy feeders, moderates and lights, as well as those that are going to build nutrition into the soil, beans and peas for the nitrogen and marigolds that are destroying the nasty nematodes. Now also look at this, considering that the heavy feeders tend to be your warm season crops. Your moderates are the cool season crops 
your light feeders tend to be those below ground. Kind of fascinating, huh? Uh, do you realize that, uh, you know, way back, like look at the Bible and they talk about the wise men. Why were they wise men? Because they knew the agricultural system. They watched the heavens, the stars for the weather, and they were also looking at what grew when. So pay attention to the nature, the features of the crops that you're growing and let them work for you and work for themselves. Oh, by the way, roses and tomatoes absolutely do love each other. I think they're symbiotic. Uh, growth habits, again, how tall are they going to get? And please gauge this, that's where I fail at most often. Give them the optimal amount of space and you can use the taller plants as living trellises. Uh, my son, a very young age, planted unknown to me, and he was just happenstance, planted sunflowers and uh, the birdhouse gourds that grew up alongside them. Now, this was in our front yard in a HOA area. It was so pretty and so fascinating. We didn't get turned into the HOA, but try things, try things that aren't documented, give it a whirl. Um, also use plants to alter the conditions, produce shade and wind breaks when you can. Now we have there on the top okra uh, that does grow quite tall. There are shorter varieties, but it's known to grow quite tall. And sweet peppers are on the bottom. Those are sweet peppers from my yard. And I have a problem with peppers that they get scalded by the sun there in August. So what you can do is quite literally put the peppers underneath the okra. The okra will shade and protect them as well as uh, they, they are symbiotic in their nutrients. They're, oh, I should say, compatible in their nutrients. So go ahead and put intersparse your peppers with your okra. Pest fighting features. These are turnips uh, that are the picture on the left that are a trap plant for the beetles that are going to attack other things. You'll also find that the stinky, the odiferous, the onion family will keep nasty pets away. And if you've ever seen garlic bloom, it is an allium and it is absolutely beautiful. So sometimes I grow things just because they're darn purdy. You also see that turnips can attract the army worms, the cabbage loppers, they're going to keep things away and in their proper place. And the uh, underground portion of the turnips are still good to eat. You're not going to have your turnip greens so much unless you like them looking like lace. Now, plants that attract beneficials, I have this up here. And this is actually a USDA guideline. And you can see the insect that it attracts, as well as the pest that it's going to de defer to get away, deter, I should say, and the plants and the habitats it likes to have. What's not on here uh, that it should mention is having a water source. I know a water source can be dangerous because of mosquitoes. I do have a pond uh, that is excellent for the damsel flies and uh, dragonflies. And they, it, it, uh, it's a moving pond it, and I do have the Zambesia fish in there so I don't get mosquito larvae in it. But I will tell you what a darn good job those damselflies and dragonflies do in their reconnaissance of just picking off all the little nasty thrippy kind of things that are in the air. So I do recommend that if you have room and, and uh, have a home for the damsel and dragonflies in addition to having plants that attract the beneficial insects. Companion plants. I did say this was coming up and there's plenty of resources online to show you companion plants. There's a little bit of hazard though to it uh, that they may show plants that say grow together in the Northeast. You're not going to have uh, the cool crops growing the same type as the hot crops here in, in Texas. So if you're going to do the companion planting, I suggest using something more Texas specific. I did find this one out of San Antonio and it's sustainable San Antonio. And this was a very good companion uh, planting 
seasonal companion planning that was a lot better than many of the other ones that I did see. So you can take a little screenshot of that and uh, Google it with San Antonio. There's physical defenses to help you in the garden. There are fence fences. They can keep the bad animals and critters out, but don't be afraid to use the fences as a support system for plants that you want to grow. One year I did the loofahs, the loofah, the scrubby loofah squash. Oh, it was gorgeous on the fence. And it, it makes the whole area aesthetic also. Trellises, cages keep your vegetables off the ground and away from the insects. And these both form the fences and the trellises, windbreaks and shade, which will also help you with temperature control. Uh, you can also get insect protection using your frost cloth. It lets air in, keeps insects out, and it does also help with shade for the summer. So don't be afraid to use your frost cloth year round. Scheduling, remember this as part of the French techniques, you can do crop rotation by year for the feeding attributes. And the example on the left is showing year by year, but you can also do it season by season, particularly here in Texas, because we have uh, extreme temperatures uh, in between, but we also have moderate enough temperatures in spring, fall, and even in the winter that you can use certain crops in those times. Here's the same area, spring, and then late spring and summer. And you can see on the left in the spring, I have peas and spinach growing. And yes, I could care less that this is around my swimming pool. I think they're beautiful. So I plant all around the pool. And in front yard, I plant out by the road. Nobody really realizes there's a tomato in between the hibiscus, but it grows right out at the road. And you can also see on the right, which is a late summer and the tomatoes are ripening. I do like the golden tomatoes, the, the large ones as well as the small. I make a blonde salsa. And uh, this is very much uh, shows that I'm very poor at planning for mature size. You'll find that organics, your uh, plants do quite healthy and often um, over, overgrow the size that is predicted on this, the seed the seed packets. So they're doing very well and very abundantly producing. And I think they're beautiful. Succession planting. Now these were both harvests uh, in November. So I'm pulling out tomatoes, even the tomatoes green. I put them in my garage and I had them through the end of January ripening. I had the most success with the Roma type to tomatoes ripening in, in the fall through the winter. And these were all picked in November. Peppers, zucchini. Um, I do plant squash and another round with the uh, green beans and peas. I, I plant them the about the third week of August, unless it's really too hot, right through Labor Day and I harvest through Thanksgiving. Relay planting, you can start planting before other things are harvested. Go ahead and do that. You can bring in your pollinators. That lettuce has well bolted. You're bringing in pollinators and also because it's past its maturity, it's attracting insects to eat it as a trap plant. So go ahead and start planting the next thing before another crop is fully mature. Planting by a moon is an old fashioned, very old fashioned technique. And for many, it works. And if nothing else, it, I think it governs me to, to go and do something on a schedule. So as far as the cycles of the moon, the full moon to the new moon, from full to it's uh, fading away, this causes things, wait, I'm going the wrong way, full to new. Uh, causes seeds to swell and a greater germination for better established plants. So the waning of the moon, you're going to do things below the ground uh, from, well, which is the other way, the, from the full to the, de, uh, to the day before it is new again. So as the waxing, when the moon's coming up and getting more full, plant the above grounds, the below grounds when it's fading away. 
And no, that isn't a picture of the moon. I didn't have one. That's a picture of the sun when the west winds were coming in and blowing all the dust from Lubbock over. So pay attention to the moon cycles and be a wise man and wise woman. Pests, what are you gonna do about the pests? Well, one pest is weeds. The other is going to be insects. This is my favorite weed control tool. You heard the phrases nip it in the bud, get to the root of the matter, go ahead and use a mattock. I use a two and a half pounder. When uh, I got one, when I left home, my dad gave me a mattock. And as each of my kids left home, they got a mattock. You can pull weeds, you can dig with this thing, you can uh, dig or uh, cultivate around plants. Caution if you are taking out perennials because you wanna get the whole root and a mattock is gonna do this for you. Now that question of till or don't till, till and don't till is more of an agricultural kind of uh, method. Uh, I do turn the soil in my beds. Uh, I do it uh, on purpose. To, uh, I get out leftover root matter from some trees that seem far enough away, but I do do this. And yes, I might be bringing up some seeds, but I do the stale seed bed method, meaning I turn it when I see, right before I'm ready to put in my own crops, I turn the top again. I hoe them in. I actually use my mattock to turn them in. Uh, you do not want to uh, till Bermuda, nut sedge, those things shown there, because they're just going to produce more and more all the time. Don't do that. Uh, I also do a, a scraping mechanism uh, if I see seeds, seed bearing weeds coming after because I don't want them to reproduce. And if you're real bold, and I haven't done this, I don't have a flamethrower, but I've seen people do that. It is organic when you think about it, burning, uh, burning, uh, fields as well as uh, uh, torching was an ancient technique. There are, uh, there is a pre-emergent, it is the corn gluten mill. I will tell you that everything is in the timing of corn gluten mill, that it prevents seeds from germinating weed seeds as well as your own seeds that you may be putting in. So caution when using this. No worries if you miss that window, it is also a, a nitrogen source about a 900 are shown there. As far as post-emergence, vinegar uh, works as well as citric acids. Citric acids are things like orange oil and you will dilute that with water and mix it up. Uh, the vinegar, you can get the 20%, though I have used the the, the, the kitchen kind, 5%, it works on, on many weeds. Caution, if it's windy, you don't want these to hit things that you do want to keep. There are also herbicidal soaps and iron-based herbicides and salt-based herbicides. You have to hit the plant and you don't necessarily want these going into the ground. Uh, I hope I didn't go too fast on that. Let me try again, there we go. Uh, here's the 20% vinegar. And by the way, that is approved uh, as an organic kind of, of for uh, agriculture. And you see there OMRI on the picture on the right. I wanted to mention that, that that is a, a third party that tests organic products. I like to look at OMRI online. Uh, they will tell you the uh, chemical name as well as the product names that you can get organics in. So MRI is a third party research source that you might like to, to look at. Uh, the uh, key on the surface hitting the plants and killing them, knocking them back, it's burning the exposed foliage. It works best on annuals, not perennials. It is also effective on warm, sunny days. However, non-selective means if you hit a plant that you love, it's going to damage, if not kill it. Unlike the synthetics that are going, that are being put on, it's not being absorbed into the plant, translocating into the plant. So it's not living on in perpetuity and going into the soil. There's that OMRI and I have it up there as reference. So you can look at it by 
product as well as the generic material. And it does give you information on it. It is downloadable. I really do like this as a third party source for organics. Here are some certified products. Uh, limonene is the orange oil. It's in Avenger. And you can see them listed here. I won't say all of them. I also want to caution you too, when you do look at products in the store, pick them up and look at them. It, they may start out as organic, but some of them will add a synthetic booster to them. So be cautious of that. Uh, this, by the way, this list came up as an alternative glyphosate. Glyphosate is the Roundup. Let's look at insects or let's not look at them because they are pests. Very good way to control insects, particularly on your vegetables, is to use phenology. It's the study of the timing of biological events and when there will be development of plants and insects. The insects aren't going to come out unless the plants are there for them to eat. And even though they're going to say, put a plant in, you know, in May, June, is it cold? Is it uh, is it too warm that year? Did you miss your window of opportunity? Are the bugs, the insects already out? Well, you can use phenology and study the timing of the temperature and when they are going to, these pests are going to come out. So how do you know? What is this magic temperature? It's based on growing degree days. And this is using a running average temperature, the high and the low divided by two gives you the average minus 50 as a 50 is where there's plant germination and insects tend to come out just as a gauge. It will vary by insect as well as plant, as you can see there on the right. And how do you find the growing degree days? Well, you can get very specific on the, oh, excuse me, the information on this, it's available from NOAA, the Growing Degree Days, as well as there are third party sources. Uh, Mississippi State University will tell you right down to your zip code what your growing degree days are. So you can gauge your insect management as well as your plants flourishing. You may want to keep them protected, your plants protected in pots before putting them out uh, to avoid insects that are emerging. Now, insect control doesn't mean eradication. You need insects, different bugs for pollination, as well as the ecosystem of the food source for the wildlife. There are good bugs that are gonna regulate the bad bugs. How do you know who's who? Well, here are some resources for you. You can look at many of these on your phone as well as research them online. Uh, one that is very local to Dallas is citybugs.tamu.edu. It's done by Mike Merchant, who has retired from the AgroLife Extension Service, but I understand he continues to maintain this area and he does have a blog. So if you're into the insects, by all means, do follow uh, Mike through citybugs.tamu.edu. Now, all chemicals can be poisonous, even water. They can be toxic to people, plants, and pets. So it's very important to pay attention to the rate that you're applying your different uh, pesticides. I like Field Guides. Kaufman Guide happens to be my favorite. You can choose a Field Guide. I like to have it out there in the yard, look things up, or just simply sit with a cup of tea and research the area. I did meet Ken Kaufman, the man is a genius. I did a uh, bird tour with him at uh, White Rock Lake and it will live on in my memory forever. So I do recommend on a personal level, the Kaufman Guide, easy to follow. And it does show you the stage that the insect is in to readily identify it and not be killing those ladybugs while they look like little alligators. For insect control, you can do the IPM, Integrated Pest Management Methods. Go ahead and hand pick them, a physical control of hand picking them off. You can stomp and squish them. You can, uh, <laughs> uh, my dog likes to eat grasshoppers. She's a, a gem. Uh, if you see aphids uh, forming, 
blast them with water until those ladybugs appear and can start munching them for you. You can make your own traps as shown there. So things don't have to be expensive. Repellents, go to the odiferous, use herbs, ground up crushed plants. That is garlic from my yard and it will keep many pests away. They just don't like it. These produce not only smell, but also oils. There are insecticidal soaps and I will encourage you to use the insecticidal soaps rather than your homemade though I have used a very plain Joy Lemon. It's a very inexpensive from the dollar store. I have diluted it and used it, not just as an insecticidal to break down the chitin, uh, which is the out exoskeleton of uh, the insects, uh, but it's also a surfactant that sticks to them and will block out their breathing area. But go ahead and use the insecticidal soaps and horticultural oils. These will not damage your plants where some homemade remedies might do that. Again, follow the directions. Uh, twice as much won't kill things, kill insects twice as fast or twice as dead. Pay attention to the temperature you're applying at and if rain is forecasted and these are often more effective or could be lethally effective to your plant if it is too sunny out. There are biological controls uh, in place to naturally and introduced. There's a predator to the fire ants. It is a very, very tiny fly, a forward fly. You know how big a fire ant is? Well, you can see this tiny little fly landing, laying an egg, and then its young comes out the head that climbs out and has killed the fire ants. There are also pathogens that are specific to different kinds of insects. For example, Bt that we, met, we mentioned before is caterpillars, but if you want pretty butterflies, be careful of which plants you're putting it on. BTI does the mosquito larvae. Spinosad or spinosad is a bacteria, but it is non-selective. It will kill fire ants, caterpillars, et cetera, some beetles, and will also be a fatal to bees, honeybees, bumblebees, native bees. Be careful with your spinosids as well as your timing so you get your pollination for those that need pollination. Native toads are good too. What they're doing is carrying the bacteria and will get the below ground uh, where you have the emergence of insects. Other controls, neem, biological, because it is an extract of the neem tree. You also have the essential oils of many herbs. These are contact killers. So you're going to have to hit them to dissolve that outer area. Pyrethe rum is from the chrysanthemums. These actually grow, the ones that they use to make pesticides grow in Africa. Uh, once they are uh, reduced to the pyrethrin, which actually paralyzes pests. Be careful on this. They'll often add synthetics to finally kill off the paralyzed bugs. Uh, there's also a caution on the eugenol, which is a form of the clove oil, and it can be very harmful to humans on contact. There are insect control minerals, DE, which will also help the soil, even if you don't hit the bugs. Kaylin Clay uh, was going to put a film on your plants, but keeps those grasshoppers away. Boric acid has been used, borox has been used for many years, as well as sulfur. And in the case of sulfur, it is a disease control, not only an insect mitigator. So that concludes everything that I had. I tried to keep it concise. Uh, if you have questions, I can take them if they're in the chat and I'll stay on the line as long as you want me. Thank you so much, Linda. This has been fantastic. And I can tell you, we had a very active chat. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there was a question about when you were talking about how you can test your own soil by putting it in a jar with water. How far should you dig down to get your soil sample? 
That's a really good question. So I usually do this from a bed that I've already prepared. And that way I've turned over at least a foot and I've turned that over for the bed. So I'm getting what's there. Now, remember I told you about my, my yard. I have uh, clay in the front yard, sand in the back. It's quite fascinating what I get when I dig because I have like a, I have a sand layer under the clay. It just naturally happens. So I would say, do it, pull your sample from a prepared bed area because that is going to be the condition you're putting your plant into. All right, that sounds good. Okay, so we had several questions about compost. All right, so um, so one of our questions, actually this came from YouTube, was how long does it take for a bag of leaves to turn into compost? Well, it depends, doesn't it? Uh, a bag of leaves, and, and I'm saying the bag, it, it may not have the, a, enough air getting to it. So that is a restrictor on it. I, I, it's better to be out getting its air as well as a bag is going to maintain the same moisture level. So it may be too moist and get anaerobic, get stinky and not break down. So take it out of the bag and then it's a matter of in, in the pile it's going to vary on the air and the moisture level. Think about nature though. If it's just leaves falling, they're generally gone by the next season. And as far as even when I mulch, I'm do, I do my mulch about twice a year. There, it's breaking down pretty darn quick. So as far as how long is it gonna take, it's going to be a function of the air and the moisture and uh, if you did get any nitrogen mixed in with there, if there are a few green leaves, it's going to speed it up even more. All right. So we have a question about a couple more things that should or should not go into your compost. So, for example, hair and different types of manure, like, like for example, the uh, manure from rabbits versus the manure from dogs. Okay. Well... I'm gonna go back to hair. Hair is perfectly fine. You can get hair at a, a, a salon and I know it may have some you know, hairspray or something on it. You can use dog hair. I use fur, dog fur, because the, you know that Irish setter, she puts off a lot of fur. It is a nitrogen source, perfectly fine. Now, the second part was the manures. I like rabbit because they tend to be pet, rabbit pets tend to be fed pellets not weed seeds are in there. Uh, I do not use domesticated animals, cat or dog, uh, because I understand they, they can have uh, uh, pathogens and uh, different bacteria that you do not want in your compost pile. Actually, for water purposes, they encourage you to pick up your dog poop and cats are even, have even more kind of things in them. It's even worse. I know there's neighborhood cats, I know, but pick up your pet poop. Don't put it in your compost pile. You can dig a hole and bury it, I understand, but do not put, it's not encouraged to be put into compost piles because of its pathogens. That's what I've read. I don't put mine in. Yes, I agree with you on that, especially with picking up your pet waste, especially right before it's gonna rain like today. Yes, uh, okay. our poopies are picked up. <laughs> I did mine yesterday. Okay, so we had a lot of conversation in the chat about Epsom salts, about uh, how you should use, should you use them? How do you use them? And then if putting caustic things like salts and vinegars um, on your garden are good for the plants and also for animals like frogs and earth. Okay, I love this question. All right, um, Epsom salts, peroxide, uh, I question this too. And like I said, uh, organic gardening is going to be a lot of personally of what you regard as organic gardening. I must have 40 books on the shelf and they do contradict one another. Is Epsom salts really an organic because it's been essentially synthesized to get out of the ground? I know it's got naturally occurring minerals, but you know, when does it, when does it become a, uh, a synthetically produced. So I, I question that too. So um, 
I have a friend that it swears she's up and down organic. So when she plants tomatoes, a tomato, she puts in a cup uh, of Epsom salts and a cup of uh, dry milk, you know, a powdered milk. And she considers herself organic. She's getting the calcium. She's getting the components of the Epsom salts. It's up to you. You decide. And that's probably what this was about. You decide your judgment of what is organic. Um, I shy away from many things that I think like, is that really? Now, as far as regarding the using the vinegar and the uh, like even the DE, you're going to have to hit the insects you, when you're doing it for insect reasons. And vinegar also dissipates rather readily. If, even if it's on a, uh, a leaf or on an insect, it, it does uh, not get into the soil. And uh, again, because many of these things are more naturally occurring in their concentration, they're not as bad as the synthetics. So you decide what's organic to you. I understand that completely. And some things give me the heebie-jeebies when they say they're organic. So it's up to you on how strict or orthodox you are and what's organic. I hope that was a good answer to everybody's thinking about it. <laughs> I think so. And it's, it's kind of like your diet, you know, it's like, uh, how strict do you want to be on your diet? And then uh, I battle with that every day. <laughs> All right. So we also had a question about one of our most dreaded insect pest guests to our garden, squash bugs. Oh boy, I, you'd be a millionaire, right? A lot of the squash bugs I under, is the phenology. Plant early to beat them. And oh, you can't get out early enough because the squash won't germinate. So start your squash and get it to mature ahead of them because they only like it at their tender stage, you know, when it's vining. So part of that is the phenology. The other theory that I've heard is plant large amounts. Expect some, you know, expect some, some spoilage, some, you know, some, some get suffered, some get sacrificed in the others. I also have found, and this worked, I tried. They said Hubbard squash will be the primary target for squash bug. I tried it, it worked. They went for the Hubbard and left the zucchini and the yellow squash pretty much alone and, and the patty pants. So try that. My other tactic with squash, you saw it. I plant squash in the fall and they tend to, the bugs that were spring oriented, the spring squash bugs tend to stay away. So try seasonal. You got the phenology, extra quantity, uh, Hubbard squash attracts them away and then try uh, fall, fall. That's what I've done. I'm not always successful. I tried a new squash, um, Oh boy, it's it's a melon and boy, they went all over it. And uh, if I think about it before the end, I'm gonna tell you what it is, but they were all over that and, and left the other uh, the other squashes alone. They left the butternut alone. That's a good idea to kind of have like a, a, a little area where you plant things to encourage the pests to dine there and leave right. the rest of your garden um, alone. So it's, it's almost like this- uh, The trap plant. Invitation, yes, your trap garden, exactly. That's a that's a really good, uh, that's a really good method if you have the space for it. So absolutely. Okay. So we also had a question about, do you have any advice about boiler feeding for herbs? The, what was the, like a spraying the leaves, foiler feeding? Oh, foiler feeding. I, I would think it would work on the herbs too. And you've got different kinds. You've got your annual basil and I have foliar fed them. Now I'm not going to fully or feed them and pick them the next day. You know, I'm putting a compost tea kind of thing on them, but I'm doing it when they're young to encourage them to grow up. And, and I have it done on the perennial ones too. So yeah, I would do it on the herbs too. 
Do you have any tips about like when the best time of day to do that is? Again, early morning or when I say late afternoon, it, it's like going to be like one or two hours before, like two hours before sunset in the summer, because I want it to dry on there. I want it to not to be wet on them at night, but in the morning is real nice. And they're open, they're real open. The, the models are open and, and taking it in. All right, fantastic. Well, Linda, this has been a wealth of information. You also got many, many thank yous in the chat for sharing all of your knowledge with us today. We also wanna thank our audience for being here with us. Uh, we know this presentation was a little long. That's because it had so much good information in it. And remember, it will be on the Dallas Public Library's YouTube page, so you can reference it, you can share it, it's always there. If you pre-registered for our session, you will be getting an email in a few days from the Dallas Public Library that will have a link to the recording and any information that Linda shares with us and some of the links. And also, I want to invite you for our next session for Grow With Us on Monday, March 29th. And this one's going to be really neat. This is about a vegan cooking with a group called Latin X. So they're going to share, um, you can actually follow along if you want uh, and cook several different vegan dishes with this group. And this presentation will be bilingual. So invite your Spanish speaking friends to join us as so we can all maybe try a little bit, a little bit of change to our diet and add in a lot of those vegetables that we've all been growing. Uh, so on behalf of the Dallas Public Library Seed Library and Dallas Environmental Quality and Sustainability, I want to thank you for being with us today. Linda, I want to thank you especially for sharing all of your information and your time with us today. And for everybody, uh, please be safe and hopefully you'll join us again soon. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.